a special Christmas experience that a friend of his had one winter night. Gloria was home late one evening, a few days before Christmas, watching TV in the living room, and his son came in from a date, and he said, Dad, we got a problem. I saw some shadowy figures lurking around out beside the house in the darkness. Well, Larry was worried that there could be thieves trying to uh, mess up his truck or get into his truck and, 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 and steal some things. So, so he looked out the, the, the window, but he didn't see anything. So he said, uh, he's probably see anything. He sat back down to TV, but after a, a, a few moments, his daughter uh, spoke from upstairs. She said, Dad, I just looked out the window and I saw some uh, some people that are, look like they're in the driveway over there in the shadows. So he said, what in the world's going on? Then he heard a bump. It sounded like it was at the garage door. So he decided he was going to take care of these thieves or pranksters. He, he went out the back door and snuck around the side of the house and he gathered up some rocks. And as he got around the side of the house near where his new pickup truck was at, he saw... Sure enough, a couple of shadowy figures there. Well, he decided to throw them to kill. And so he started chucking rocks at them hard as he could. He hit them. He hit one of them, at least because he heard the guy say, Ooh! And, and then they ran. Those guys ran. He ran after them, throwing rocks hard as he could, chasing after them. Uh, finally, they got away. He came back and started inspecting his vehicle to see if they had broken the windows, what had happened. Everything seemed fine until he made a horrifying discovery. Right at the edge of the bushes where they were hunched over, he found a ruined fruit cake. And a note on that cake let him know that it was a gift from the local church. He had tried to kill a couple of guys from the church and tried to bring them a gift. And you got to wonder what was going through those guys' minds as, as they were running away. Make a note for next year, Larry does not like fruit cake. <laughs> I don't know if anybody likes fruitcake. As a matter of fact, I heard that uh, the, the, the last fruitcake was actually made in 1975, and since then it's just been re gifted around. So it probably tasted about the same as it did then. Uh, but a lot, of time, a lot of us yesterday probably took time to turn on the modern day Christmas classic, A Christmas Story. How many of you watched A Christmas Story yesterday? <coughs> Yeah, up twice. Okay, yeah. Uh, I love that scene at the end of the movie where Ralphie is in bed asleep and, and he's got his blue oiled steel beauty clutched in his hands, his red rider BB gun. And the narration of adult Rob, uh, Ralphie says, The greatest Christmas gift I ever received or would ever receive. That red rider BB gun. What is the greatest gift you've ever received? What's the greatest gift you've ever given? Christmas is a season of joy and love and peace and of giving. This week we, we consider the, the spirit of Christmas as the spirit of giving. And we're going to look at the story of the wise men and the gifts that they bring to Jesus. And what can we learn about the spirit, the Christmas spirit of giving from these wise men? First of all, we should bring gifts to Jesus. If you look at Matthew chapter 2, hopefully you've got your Bible in front of you or your Bible app on your phone. The screen is out. We're going to have that fixed early this week. Uh, but in Matthew chapter 2, in verse 1, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Have, have you ever been invited to a party, and when you show up, you discover that you were supposed to bring a gift, but you didn't get the memo. You're the only one who didn't bring a gift. Everybody else is exchanging presents, but you're out of it. Well, well, we are celebrating in the Christmas season the, the, the birth of Jesus, the most important birth in, in the entire universe, in the entire history of the world. How uncomfortable should we be if we come to his birthday party? Not a present. It's his birthday, so we should bring him a gift. The wise men bring gifts, which we'll talk about later, but they're living in the east, probably in the area known as present day Iraq and Iran, and they see this star. And we're not told how they knew that this star was a sign of the birth of the uh, king of the Jews, 
But more than likely, as we look at some scripture in the Old Testament, we find that God had left prophecy through when Daniel and them were taken into exile into Babylon. Prophecies probably were given and left with those people that were passed down. And so they knew that there was going to be this Messiah born, and God revealed that to them. And he called the star to shine, and he in some way let the astrologers in Persia know that this king had been born. They knew the king was born, and so they gathered their gifts, and they set out to travel to the land of the Jews so they wouldn't miss the party. And they get to Jerusalem. They go there because that is the capital of the Jewish people. And if anybody knows where the king of the Jews would be born, it would be the people in the capital. But Matthew chapter 2, verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, gathered together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. Uh, I'll just share with you uh, a, a pet peeve of mine. Uh, when were the wise men to see Jesus? Were they there the night of his birth? No, they were not. They saw the star in the east as a sign that he had been born. And so then they traveled. And it took several months for them to arrive. And by the time they arrived, Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus were no longer in a stable, but in a house. Does that mean we shouldn't have the nativity scene? The wise men, I'm not saying that. It's fine to teach our kids the wise men came and worship baby Jesus too, because they did. It was just not the same. Not the shepherds were there. As far as that goes, that when the wise men came, guess who else may have come and worshipped the Lord the same day? Shepherds may have been there then too. If you saw the, 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 the God take on flesh, little baby, would you have just been one time or would you have gone back to worship him again? I'd probably go back to worship him again. But when the word of these wise men gets around, the king uh, that the king has been born, everybody in Jerusalem is troubled, not just Herod. And we know Herod is scared the new king, king will take his power. He was, he was just eaten up with this paranoia. That's why he wants to kill the baby. But why are the rest of the people uh, in trouble? The religious leaders, did they know where, where the Messiah would be born? Yes, they sure did. It was just a, a short travel, a short distance from Jerusalem. And when they heard the words of the wise men that he had been born, they didn't even bother to go check for themselves to see if it was true. Why not? Why didn't they bring gifts to Jesus? It seemed to me like they were just too busy. They couldn't be bothered to take time away from their work and their schedule to go just a few miles to Bethlehem and see for themselves. But these wise men came from hundreds of miles away, traveling for months to bring gifts to them. Yet his own people couldn't even be bothered to go a few miles. Don't get too busy to bring Jesus again. Folks, it's sad when God's people are so excited about the birthday of Jesus, but don't feel any need to give him anything. And, and I'm as guilty of it as anybody else, being too busy and too caught up in my own life and not really thinking about anything that I can give Jesus special. That needs to change for us. The Christmas spirit of giving means we take time and effort to give a gift to Jesus. Every Christmas, uh, he should get a gift from us. And as we look at these wise men, we have more to learn about the spirit of giving. Giving starts with a heart of worship. Back in Matthew 2 verse 9. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Give Jesus your worship. The gift of the wise man was pleasing to God, 
Because they, they, it's not that they left it at the door. Hey, here's the presents. You take those and we're going to go. No, they gave, before they gave anything else, what did they give him? Themselves. Their work. They didn't understand that they were looking at God in the flesh. They didn't know that Jesus would grow up and that he would die to pay for their sins so that they could be saved. They could have eternal life. But they did know the baby was special. That his birth was foretold in prophecy. It was announced in the sky that he was a king, even if his own people didn't know that. And so they worshipped him. And the reason these gifts are so valuable in God's sight is the heart of the givers. Several years ago, Jeff Strike pointed out that God doesn't care how large your gift is. He cares how large your love is for him. Before they give their gift to Jesus, they worship and that's the way it should be for us. This Christmas that we've just gone through, and as we look forward, what are we giving Jesus? Don't think you can just buy your way out of it. Don't, don't think you can just spend money on some mission, or you can just, you know, put some clothes, give some clothes to somebody, that be Jesus' birthday present for you. You just throw money at the problem. And it seems like in the church, a lot of times, as we have grown more affluent in the church, we have gotten away from the personal investment in giving those gifts to Jesus and we think we should just write a check or we can just take out some money and give it. Listen, we should worship Jesus by giving tithes and offerings and we'll talk more about that. But don't divorce from that the idea of worship. Not only is giving those resources worship, but we should be giving them ourselves. That's the first thing we've got to give. That's what makes it Valuable in God's sight is when we give ourselves. Don't give a gift just because you feel like you have to. Give a gift in worship because He is good and you love it. We'll make another observation before I move on here. When, when we see the wise men leaving Jerusalem on their way uh, to Bethlehem to worship Jesus, they see the star, and what is their reaction when they see the star? They rejoice exceedingly with great joy. And a star leads them to Jesus, the place where they can worship Him, and they come with joy. Jesus deserves your joy, doesn't He? Doesn't He deserve your joy? In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, Paul talks about the way that the Christians in Corinth would take up a special offering uh, each week and set it aside for missions. And he tells them and us what we should do as we give. Each week we have an opportunity to give Jesus a gift through our tithes and offerings. And this is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6. This I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. But each one must do as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For what? God loves a cheerful there are times in the worship service that are serious and somber, like communion. Even in that, though, there's reason for great joy. As we think about Jesus suffering and dying on the cross for us, even in that, there's time, there's a room for great joy, isn't there? Because of the reason that he went through all that. And, and the wise men come with joy because the star shows them that they're coming to the right place at the right time to see. So they had joy. And when you come to this place to worship on Sunday, you need to know you're coming to the right place at the right time to see Jesus. To hear His words. To worship Him with your brothers and sisters. So come to this place with joy in your heart. Sometimes it seems like we come to church with anything but joy. You go into the parking lot and, and you look like you just fit into a lemon. You know? <coughs> And then you get out of the, the, you close the car door after you snap at your kids. You close the car door and then you paint the smile on your face. But it's skin deep. Jesus deserves your joy. So whatever you need to do to lay aside the hard feelings, whatever you need to do to lay aside the worries of the world, whatever you need to do to lay aside the guilt, the grief, find joy. Joy. And, and, and joy is contagious, by the way. 
put, put that on that smile on your face. Though. When you have joy in your heart, there's going, there's going to be a smile that can come to your face. So give him your joy as you put your tithe and offering in the box. Uh, give him your joy as, as you drive up in the coming weeks. Give him your joy when you're out on the water this summer or in, in, in the pretty days and you're out there. Give Jesus your joy. Worship him because he's worthy. And don't allow your relationship with Jesus to become a ritual uh, or, or, or uh, emotional drudgery. The, the wise men teach us a lot about the spirit of giving this morning. We should bring gifts to Jesus. We, we, we know that giving starts with a heart of worship. The final lesson we learned this morning is giving out of love means giving, what do you think it would mean? Giving your best. When, when you give to Jesus out of love, it means giving your best. In Matthew 2, verse 11, after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These are all valuable things these guys bring. They're wealthy in their own lands, and they bring gifts that are the best that they can get. They give their best to Jesus. And do they have any idea how these gifts are going to be used by God? Not really. But they bring the best they have. You don't always know how Jesus is going to use your gifts. These gifts, how did God use these gifts? You know, when, when Joseph takes Mary and baby Jesus and, and they leave to get away from Herod, they go down into Egypt and they're there for several years. And, and Joseph uses these treasures, he sells those treasures to support his family, feed his family in that, during that time before they, they come back up into Israel. That's, that's what those gifts were used for. They were so important. But there's a deeper meaning that I don't think anybody understood at the time behind these three, these three gifts. And, and the old hymn, We Three Kings, points out the significance of each of these gifts. The first verse, We three kings of Orient are very gifts we Travis and far, field and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star. Born a king on Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown him again, king forever ceasing, never over us all to reign. Gold. It's a gift that acknowledges the kingship of Jesus. In Revelation 19, verse 16, a, a vision of Jesus on his robe, on his thought, by he has a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And so this gift that was given, uh, it was the best that this wise man had, but, but it was given. God inspired him to give that gift because it just symbolized Jesus as the King of Kings. What about frankincense? Not Frankenstein, Frankincense. <laughs> Frankincense to offer him I, incense owns a deity thine, prayer and praising all men raising, worship him God on high. Frankincense was used during the Old Testament times in worship services. In Exodus 30 we read about it being used uh, in a recipe for incense that was used in worship services uh, and that was the only incense that could be used on the altar. So this gift of frankincense spoke to worshiping God. And, and that is, is telling us that Jesus is who? God in the flesh. What about myrrh? Myrrh is mine, it's bitter perfume. Breathes a life of gathering room, sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone cold tomb. They used myrrh in the, the process of preparing a body for burial. What did that point to? Jesus stepped on the cross and had them wrapping him up in the embalming process of the preparation for his birth. This, over, this foreshadowed the death and burial of our Savior. These gifts were valuable. They were the best these guys had to give. They didn't know just how God would use those gifts for Jesus. The King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. The suffering and dying and risen Savior. 
These were the gifts the wise men brought to Jesus. What can we bring? How can we give meaningful gifts to Jesus today? Well, give your best. Again, don't just throw money at Jesus and hope he's satisfied with your gift. Think about what would really touch his heart. That's your best. And it doesn't matter whether you're the richest person or the poorest person in the room. You can give your best to Jesus, and that's all he wants. And that's what he deserves. Jesus loves people, doesn't he? That's why he came. He died to save people. He served people. And your gift and my gift need to reflect who he is and what he's about. So you give your best to Jesus really by giving to people. When you help others, when you serve others, when, when you invest yourself in ministering to other people, that is a gift you give not only to them, to Jesus. You, you could make a, a, an effort to, to clean up the yard for that person in your neighborhood, that, that elderly person who needs help. You could intentionally, I'm going to give this gift to Jesus by serving that person. You could make a special gift in support of Ezekiel Fish and Thailand and the ministry there. You know, we should be praying for him every day in the mission. You can commit to praying every day. I'm going to pray every day. Lord, that is going to be a gift that I can give you. I'm going to pray every day specifically for Ezekiel and his wife and their mission there in time. You could buy a bag of groceries for a neighbor in need, couldn't you? And, and, and you might have to take a mortgage on your house to do that today. But you could buy a bag of groceries for a neighbor that's in need. And, and you could give that as a gift. And just, I, Lord, I love you, and I see this person in need, and I want to help this person in need. So this is a gift to you, Lord. And, and invest in that relationship. Invest in, in that person. You could volunteer to help in the crisis pregnancy center regularly as your gift to Jesus. You could, should, you could commit to, to sending birthday cards and encouraging notes to people in the congregation. Uh, and that could be a gift that you give to Jesus. What you offer to Him is going to cost you something. It's going to cost you an investment. What is it? I, I think the answer is going to be different for each one of us. The wise men brought different gifts. They didn't all bring gold. They didn't all bring frankincense. They didn't all bring myrrh. And for us, what we give to Jesus is going to be different. What I give is going to be different from what you give. The point is, though, we all bring something, don't we? Because we all have something to bring. Now, you need to put some thought into this and be intentional about what you're going to give Jesus. Something that, that uh, you find joy in giving to Him because He loves a cheerful giver. But He also loves a generous giver. Right? A cheerful giver is going to be a generous giver. So give your best and show him your love by loving and serving other people. Jesus did say, whatever you do to the least of these brothers of mine, you've done unto me. So, so when it's all said and done, as I look at the, the, the spirit of giving, the Christmas spirit of giving, what we find is that Jesus deserves our best. But the first gift we must give is what? Ourselves, our heart. This Christmas season, as we consider the spirit of Christmas, it's a spirit of love and peace and joy and giving. And giving, uh, the spirit of giving comes straight from God the Father because what did He do? He gave. He gave His one and only Son. The Bible describes the gift, the gift like this For God, the greatest love. So loved to the greatest degree. The world, the greatest number. That he gave the greatest act. His only begotten son, the greatest gift. That whosoever the greatest invitation, believe him, the most son. In him, the greatest person should not perish the greatest deliverance, but have the greatest certainty, everlasting life, the greatest
greatest possession. Jesus has already given the best to us. What are we giving him? We, we started early on in the message today asking, what's the greatest gift you've ever been given? You know the answer, right? It's Jesus. What is the greatest gift you've ever given? I hope and pray that it's yourself. That you give yourself to Him. That you hold nothing back. And then as you seek to give Him the best gifts that you can give Him, you look at the people that He's put in your life around you. And you give cheerfully and generously to them. Because you're really giving Him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your great love. We thank you for your generosity. The, the way that you have lavished your love on us, it, it's just amazing. And we've just gone through this Christmas season and we've celebrated your coming and the mission of coming to die for us. We know that you deserve and you expect more from us than just to nod our head and, and sing a song or two. Lord, you want us, the very best of us, that you would have first place supremacy in everything. So we pray today, Lord, that you would help us to give you first place in our heart, help us give ourselves to you, and then, Lord, help us to see the opportunity that you put around us to love others and serve others. Because, Lord, really, we're serving you when we do that. We praise you. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody say, we're going to stand right now and we're going to sing Silent Night. And, and as we sing Silent Night, what we're, going to, what we're going to realize is this is Jesus' invitation to you. If you've never accepted the greatest gift ever given, you can come as we sing Silent Night. And you could accept Jesus as your Savior. Be baptized in His name. Be forgiven for your sins. And receive that great inheritance of eternal life. If you need to make that decision, won't you come as we sing? So